Coming up, a catch up with Australian music industry legend Michael Chugg. Michael, or Chuggy, along with another industry giant, the late Rob Potts, created CMC Rocks, which has been staged in Ipswich since 2015. COVID put a last minute stop to the event in 2020 and again this year. In its place in 2021, you'll hear about CMC Rocks Your Yard. Keep listening for the details and the Michael Chug story. It's Sunday, March 14, 2021, and I'm Alan Roebuck. Welcome to Ipswich Today, which acknowledges the traditional custodians of the land on which it is produced and pays respects to elders past, present and emerging. This podcast is supported by Kinetics, people-powered web hosting trusted by Australian businesses since 1999. For anyone growing up in the 70s, 80s and 90s and more recently, their music tastes would have been unknowingly influenced by my special guest. A pioneer of the Australian music industry, Michael Chugg has earned a reputation both locally and internationally as one of the country's most prominent music promoters and is a name synonymous with some of the biggest tours to have come through Australia and New Zealand over the past 50 years. In more recent times for Ipswich and country music, his magic touch, along with business partner, the late Rob Potts, brought us CMC Rocks Queensland. This interview with Chuggy was recorded on Friday, March 12. Thanks for speaking with Ipswich today, Michael Chuck. Pleasure. You attended the private funeral service this past week of fellow industry legend Michael Gadinsky. He's gone way too soon. Is there anything you feel you can share from the service? Um, well, the sh- service was really magical and the, the rabbi who uh, did the service was just incredible. He was, it was like he was one of us. He was young and vibrant and, um, you know, he certainly uh, treated Michael the way Michael would have wanted him. And that was very special and... Uh, Matt spoke one. His son spoke wonderfully. His daughter Kate brought everybody to sobs. I mean, um, Lee Simon, who was his great friend, the radio legend. Um, mm-hmm. He, um, David Campbell, opened the proceedings and uh, did all the housekeeping that needed to be done. I mean, there were over four hundred people in Norman Hall. It was um, wow. It was quite amazing, and there was probably double that outside as well. And Jimmy spoke, and uh, then Mahalia, Jimmy, and Mahalia's uh, youngest, and Diesel, did an incredible um, song, and I can't remember. It's all a bit vague. I can't remember what the song was. It was very beautiful. A very emotional day for you and many others. Yeah, it was. And Frank Stavala, who was the long-time mate and then ran Premier Artists, and Philip Jacobson, our financial guy for 40, 50 years, spoke. And Anna Toman, who works with Michael in the, you know, does all the entertainment for the AFL and the horse racing, spoke. And I spoke and got to, you know, let everybody know that... Uh, you know, Mushroom will grow and continue to shine brightly and it'll become a huge legacy for probably one of the greatest people Australian music industry's ever seen. And, you know, the memories and all he did, Alan, for the whole music thing oh, was just incredible. It is incredible. Now, music is your elixir of life and it still drives you today. Uh, it was mm-hmm. in your blood from very early in life. How would you describe those first years? Oh, look, from the moment I can remember, you know, two years old or whatever, I can remember music. We were surrounded by music. Uh, Nobody in our family was musical, but my dad was up in the Solomon Islands toward the end of World War II with all the Americans. And my nan used to make the best fruitcake you've ever had in your life. (laughs) I mean, the Yanks couldn't even make carrot cake, still can't. <laughs> and uh, Dad, yeah, they used to all hang on Dad when the care package with the fruitcake arrived. So when I was about two or three, I, I remember 
every month or so, there'd be a brown box, rectangular box arrive. And it'd be full of all these amazing, colourful things. Fat Swallow, Glenn Miller, Harry, whatever his name, (laughs) the Flower Drum Song, My Fair Lady, Oklahoma, all the latest, Fats Domino, Woody Herman, all the latest American music. So what Dad had set up was he had two or three Yanks, one in Chicago, one in Texas, one in New York. He'd send them fruitcakes from poor old Nan and they'd send him records. That's a fair enough trade. (laughs) And I grew up listening to those records. I wasn't allowed to touch them. Mm. Um, And uh, Dad, when Dad came home, he started uh, the Northern Tasmanian Rugby Union, which was, you know, quite a shove up the nose for the social snobs that ran Union in Hobart in those days. And, that, uh, you know, the team was uh, the Northern Tasmanians. Were, it was, there was a Scotch 5-8 and there was an Italian half-back and a, a killer, nasty Irishman in the front row. And the uh, referee was a gay Englishman. And Terry, his name was, he had the first stereo sound system. Wow. And uh, the two speaker boxes used to take up the entire lounge room. <laughs> And every Sunday morning we'd go around there and listen to Dad's albums and his albums. And so I grew up. And then when I was about nine, my his his sister, Auntie Barbara, she was actually the first chug to uh, escape from Tasmania. But she had, and I never ever found out how or why, but she had every Sun Records 45. You remember the, when they used to come with a hole in the middle? Yes, yes. She had Elvis, times. she had mm. Perkins, she had Cash, she had Jerry Lee. And I'd sit in her bedroom on Sunday afternoons down at Nan's listening to this amazing music. So, of course, Dad was an usher at the, uh, as well as being a fireman, was an usher at the uh, movie theatres. And um, I remember I was supposed to be going to catechism down at the Catholic Church. I watched every Thursday, Wednesday, Thursday. I watched Love Me Tender 38 times. <laughs> oh, you must have liked it. You like the music. Oh, I, just, I just loved Elvis and the mm, music. Mm. And anyway, you know, and I, I was really into it. And then along came the Beatles. And I ran a dance from the local cycling club. And that was it. Show business is your life, and without the business side sorted, there would be no show. Did you have any mentors in those early days to sharpen your skills? Yeah, there were uh, the late Ron Blackmore, who was one of the great promoters out of Melbourne, who went on and ran Paul Dainty's operation for years, was a huge mentor. Um, obviously, when I got to Melbourne, um, you know, I used to watch, I'd go down to the local concert hall and you know there'd be a local dance hall there'd be like a, one of the big bands like the flies or the group or the groove and twilights i used to walk all over tasmania i'd go to devonport on a thursday night watch the band there watch them in launceston on the friday and then walk to hobart to see them on the saturday walk to hobart well he tried <laughs> <laughs> A pretty safe hitch, I can remember. Man. Well, yes, it would have been. It would have been. And um, you know, I'd watch and just just learn, basically. Mm. Mm. And um, I was lucky that every, a lot of people liked me, so a lot of people helped me on my way. And then I met Michael Gadinsky in Melbourne, and he was fifteen, and I was twenty, and that's really you know incredible. So the chemistry uh, was there I, from day one with you two. Yeah, yeah, mm. pretty much. That's where it all began. I just got off the boat from Tasmania. I used to tell people I, I escaped. It took me <laughs> two days to swim back straight. Um, yeah, I, look, I, I I got up on the roof once in, in Launceston and put an aerial up so I could listen to 3UZ and things like that. Just and to get I, the yeah, latest music. Yeah, mm. I used to live on the Bob Rogers every Sunday morning, the Bob Rogers Top 40. Yep. And, of course, Alan, as you know, back in those days, you could hear 
Patty Page singing, and then you'd hear Elvis, and then you'd hear um, Reg Lindsay or yeah. um, Slim Dusty, and then you'd hear another great uh, pop song from Brenda Lee. Or so the music was really varied. I mean, one of my favourite acts at the time was a, a young duo from Scottsdale called the Singing Kettles. The Singing Kettles. Can't say I've heard of them. The Singing Kettles are in the Australian Country Music Hall of Fame, my son. Oh, I must check it out. Yes, you better. I, I'm slightly younger than you, but only just. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> along with Slim Dusty. I certainly, I've met Slim many times, yes. yes. Yeah, along mm. with him and the sheep from Scrubby Creek yep. and Red Lindsay and yep. one or two others, the Singing Kettles, you know, they were superstars in Tasmania, but I do believe they are in the Australian Country music all the same. Oh, I'm going to have to put it on my to-do list. Now, the oh. list of the list of artists and concerts you've been involved with over half a century is huge. The roll call of stars is the Who's Who: The Police, Sinatra, Madonna, Guns N' Roses, Bob Dylan, Neil Young, Elton John's in there as well. The list goes on, and I want to come to CMC Rocks shortly. But first, is it possible to name the top three significant moments that affected your own destiny? I I was a freelance tour director coordinator in the 70s and I worked pretty exclusively with Paul Dandy. I did the uh, huge outdoor tours with ABBA and David Bowie and Fleetwood Mac. Nice. And uh, I was I was in London with Kevin Boric. We were making an album and Kevin took me to the live scene to see the police and you couldn't be in London and not notice what was going on with bands like The Clash and mm. Elvis Costello and Reckless Eric and uh, madness and the specials and uh, I came back to Australia and I had a deal with Paul where if I found an actor I wanted to do we'd do it together. I came back and I said listen I want to start doing all that new music from uh, England. He said I'm not touring that East End scum. <laughs> really Paul? <laughs> so I true I might colour that up a bit but it's basically <laughs> what he said he wanted to be to Paul Anyway, uh, there was a premier artist directors meeting the following Sunday. While I'd been in London, Gadinsky, had, I missed him in London. He'd gone on to New York. So we're sitting at premier arts. I said, Michael, I think it's time we started our own touring company. And he said, oh, that's great. He said, I saw my mate Ian, our mate Ian Copeland, who was the agent in America for the police squeeze. He did Split Ends, he did Hooter Gurus, a lot of Australian acts as well. Mm -hmm. He had a company called FBI, Frontier Booking International. And Michael said, yeah, I've spoken to him, we can call our touring company Frontier. And I said, well, you're on it. I said, all we do now is get some action. He opened up this old brown, the old briefcase, yeah. like a carpet bag, and he had all the publishing contracts for the police, the squeeze, Elvis Costello, Madness, The Specials, Reckless Eric. What a collection. And away we went. Wow. And a year later we did Squeeze and we did The Police and that was the beginning of the front of your touring company. That is probably one of the greatest moments of my life. Oh, no doubt. No doubt. Uh, I think uh, having a worldwide hit with the young Brisbane band Shepherd about uh, seven, eight years ago was just monstrous because I was able to say to Gadinsky, well, I've had the big hit you haven't had yet. <laughs> That was very special. Um, and, you know, just, oh, there's so many moments, but it's been an incredible life. I mean, being being close friends with um, Billy Joel and Michael and I were very close with him. And uh, I suppose uh, the, I was a very lucky man that the 40 Day Elton John tour finished nine days before COVID closed it down. Yeah. So I suppose you've got to put that in the top three, don't you? Oh, absolutely. Several generations of Australians would have had very different memories of growing up without your influence. Now, looking through the names you've been associated with, everyone would be like your children. You've already hinted, but did you have any favourites? Oh, I love I love Billy. Billy was, I still do. Billy, very, very special. I'm very close to Robbie Williams, who we bought out in 2000. He had huge hits in England. They weren't playing his records here. 
Mm. We did an arena tour. All of a sudden, the record started to get played, and we brought him back and ended up doing 600,000 in outdoor stadiums. Wow. That was pretty special. Um, the Dixie Chicks, I was at a CMA, Country Music Association in America, conference in Chicago way back in the 90s and uh, late 90s and I found there was a bottle of wine and a demo tape, a cassette on my bed. It was from a guy, uh, Simon Renshaw, who I'd met on, he was the ZZ Chops account Mm -hmm. and uh, he'd left this demo of these three girls for me and uh, it was the Dixie Chicks and we brought them out and we played at small pubs and then we played small theatres and you know, obviously we ended up, like their last tour, they played CMC Rocks a couple of years ago. Yeah, I was there. How awesome was it? Well, oh, it was unbelievable. And I mean, that that was, you know, we'd done some big tours with them, but mm. that tour, we broke all the records with them. I love those girls. Great people. And obviously the two sisters are some of the greatest musicians I've ever seen. You've received a list of industry accolades and awards longer than two arms. And you also throw yourself boots and all into some great charity events. How do you squeeze 48 hours into every 24? Oh. <laughs> you do your best. Um, you know, it's one thing about losing my mate is that at least we're going to have six, seven weeks to do music from the home front this year, not three weeks. Yeah, exactly. You know, so... It's when we did the wave aid for the tsunami in Asia. I mean, we did that in a month, and everybody thought we were crazy. And then when we did sound relief and we did the SCG and the MCG with about four weeks' notice, everybody, no one can believe we do that sort of shit. That is just un- it's unbelievable. It's what you do, the mm-hmm. passion. And yep. You just do it. And, you know, um, and we love doing it. And, you know, one of the great things that we've all been able to do is, you know, it's all very well to take, but to be able to give back is probably the greatest thing a human being can do. And uh, we've lived by that most of our lives. And the proof is yeah. out there. The proof is out there. Yeah, I mean, and I've lost a lot of wonderful people, you know. My mate, Rob Potts, yeah, who I met back in the 70s, there was a... I was in my office in North Sydney and uh, the girl at the front desk said, there's a Tasmanian guy here called Rob Potts. He said, you don't know him, but he'd like to meet you. So we sat for a couple of hours and um, I gave him my time and we became, you know, sort of mates. And he went off and he got into the rock music business and he was copping a lot of shit from a few people. So he started, he got into the country music business and, um, You know, he was doing really well with it and I uh, got a bit close when a few years ago Billy Thorpe did a duet with Melinda Schneider and that was my first trip up to the Golden Guitars. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'd done a lot of shows in Tamworth with Dax like Sherbet, Skyhawks and all those. But And um, Rob and I renewed our relationship and I was, you know, we'd run into each other, share a glass of red wine. Yeah. So is this where CMC Rocks was born or fermented? About 12 years ago, he came to me. He said, I want to start a country music festival. And I said, oh, okay. He said, I'd like you to be involved. You know, he said, because I'm a bit short of finance and we can, you can help and we'll do it. He said, I want to do it in the snowy mountains. And you said, what? <laughs> I said, yeah, sure. And, uh, I thought, oh, that's interesting because, you know, Alan, in England, in Europe and America in the summer, mm. everybody goes to the mountains. Guess mm. what? In Australia, they don't. So it was a tough call. We had an unknown American called Taylor Swift come out the first year. Uh, a friend of ours, Sean James, who used to run Warners, was running uh, Foxtel, so we got Foxtel involved, and we called it CMC Rocks, and we started in the snow after, I don't know whether it was four years there, we moved it to the Hunter Valley. It started to really pick up, and we find Rob had been trying to get Alan Jackson to come out for about 20 years, 
and we finally got him here, and he played the CMC and the Hunter. Um, and it's you know we were starting to build it nicely, and um, and um, we got a call from a friend of ours who used to be at New South Wales Events, who'd moved to TEQ, Tourism and Events Queensland. Yes. And Rob and I and my MD at the time, Matthew Lazarus Hall, we flew to Brisbane, drove to Ipswich Golf Club and met with the infamous Lord Mayor yes. and our mate from TEQ and we went out to Willow Bank and I looked at the parklands at Willow Bank and we went, yeah, let's do it. So we moved it to Queensland and it, and it exploded and, you know, in 2019, we had the it was that was the year we had the Dixies and I yes. think we had um, Darius Rucker as well that year. Yep, heap of young American superstars, and yeah, it was incredible. It must have been heartbreaking this time last year to cancel at the last minute as COVID took hold. Yeah, look, I was praying. We had about what ten days before mm. the, the shit hit the fan. When they cancelled the Mel, I was in Melbourne with Robbie Williams because he was doing the Melbourne Grand Prix. And the morning before they cancelled, and that's when it all went to shit. And we had to cancel CMC Rocks, and it was, you know, a couple of acts like Kip Moore and one of the other. They were already in the country, so we had to blow it off. And then, of course, there was no way last year could have happened, so we've had to put it off again. Yeah, and then we put it off this year. We're doing a big um, – this uh, the weekend of the 20th coming up, we're doing a huge uh, weekend on Apple Music. I was, I was about to ask you about that. It's a, it's a virtual CMC rock. CMC rocks your, rocks your yard. How is that going to work? It's being uh, run out of uh, the Apple Studios in Nashville and everybody, all the artists and agents and managers and the CMA in Nashville and everybody have all come to the party. So you've got – Morgan Evans will be hosting it. And you've got Australian acts. You've got uh, some of the big American acts, Luke Combs and all that. Some will be live in the Apple Studio. Some will be magic moments from the previous uh, CMCs. That is awesome. That's going to be great listening. Yeah, yeah it'll be fun, you know. We just, we've got such a loyal bunch of fans, mm, yep. followers that, and everybody, I think, is being, you know, looking at the fan pages and, and the comments on the CMC Rocks pages. Everybody is being patient, understanding the situation we're in. Yeah, well, you know, we had, we sold, what, 19,000 tickets and you've got to, you know, and everybody's been able to get a refund and we've still got about 10,000 people sitting on their tickets for next year. What loyalty is that? That is just unbelievable. It is unbelievable, you know, and mm. I mean, you know, we've said several times, you know, if you need the money, just get a refund. Now, and, I, know, you know, I, I know you're not a vaccination expert, but I've got to ask you this because you, you might be talking to some experts. Do you have any idea what a post-COVID vaccine future might look like for live music? Will we get back to normal? Oh, I think we will. Um, there's a lot. Of, you know, it's, a, it's so hard at the moment, I mean. I'm involved with some of the hottest young Australian acts like Lime Cordial, Shepherd, and, uh, and Casey Barnes, the country act. And we've all been releasing music and trying to work. And Casey did a Queensland tour to small audiences because the government gave him a grant. You know, Lime Cordial did, we did some shows in Brisbane, seven shows at Tivoli last week. That we had to post one three times. Yeah, they need to sort out the borders. Yes, they need to open the borders and then just deal with the red spots as they happen, mm -hmm. because we can't exist. You can't. You book flights to Perth, and then two days later, Perth changed the rules, and all of a sudden, the three days you were going to get to go to Brisbane to do those shows, uh, you've now got to quarantine for three days when you get there, and then of course a week later that changes again. So the whole industry is in just we're in. It's just totally confusing. Yeah, confusing. And the, a few days before Michael died, we were discussing about look, you know, because he'd done shows with Midnight Oil and the Tetsky Brothers, and they hadn't. They were limited capacities, but they hadn't sold out. Torrens and I, because the punters have got no confidence, so they need to fix up 
the, the local borders. I can't see the international borders opening. I thought maybe January next year, but we might get them open a bit early, but it won't be much earlier. And I think, you know, as the vaccine hits in, uh, I think things will get a lot better. But I haven't read, I've been on the phone since about 9am doing different stuff, catching up. There's some stories in the newspaper today about some of the problems that are starting to occur in Denmark and a few other places with the vaccine. It's an unknown future, that's for sure. But but based on what you do know, are you semi-confident that um, CMC Rocks might happen next year? Are you, have you got oh, any plans in place? Oh, yeah, we're already working on the headliners. And yeah, better fuck it. Oops, <laughs> but better next year. I mean, you know, you can't. Yeah, I, I would say 99% that it'll happen. Well, that is very exciting, and I, and I like 99%. Can yeah. you give us a sneak preview or an exclusive about any of the headliners yet, or too too early to call? Far too early. Fair enough. Far too early. Yep. You know, there'll be, there'll be some... Yeah, well, it's far too early. You can't do that to me. Yeah, no, I won't do it to you. <laughs> um, yeah, so, I mean, you know... It, it, when Rob died, it was such a shock, and that was a very, very sad. I think the three worst moments for me this century has been when Billy Thorpe died 14 years ago last week, when Rob was tragically killed in that motorcycle accident, and, of course, Michael dying last week. And mm. they really become three milestones in the first 20 years of this century. It's pretty horrible. Yeah. And as we get older, it's it's part of the cycle of life, but still hard to deal with. It is. It is, Alan. But we live on and we'll honour them all and we'll keep the music going. And I think, yes, given another year or so, uh, the pandemic will be forgotten. But hopefully the lessons learnt will make sure that this sort of plague shit doesn't happen again. Mm. Well, it's great to talk to you today and keep on rocking for the fans. Michael Chug, thank you for talking to Ipswich today. Thanks, Alan. Bye-bye. For more on CMC Rocks Your Yard, check the CMC Rocks Facebook page or website. Ipswich Today is supported by Kinetics, people-powered web hosting trusted by Australian businesses since 1999. This podcast is also listener-supported. Please make a once-only gift or regular donation to help keep it online. Just go to ipswichtoday.com.au and click the Donate button at the bottom of the page. You can subscribe for free and share this podcast from your favourite app, including iHeartRadio, or play Ipswich Today from your smart speaker. Music is supplied by Purple Planet Music. This is Alan Roebuck. Thanks for listening.